Good morning, church. We are so excited that you've worshiped with us today. I just want to let you know about a few things happening within our church. You know, everything we mention here and more can be found on the hub. Just head on over to flushingcommunity.org backslash hub. And did you know you can actually save that web page as a link right to your home screen on your smartphone? Head over to the hub or look to learn more. Giving is a part of worship that sometimes gets overlooked as being a part of worship. But giving back to God is really a central part of worship. You know, you can give securely online at flushingcommunity.org. Click Give Online, mail a check into the church, or give in person right at the church. You know, your gifts allow us to be the hands and feet of Jesus, not only in Flushing, but around the world, because we are a bigger part of a church denomination, and we are able to spread the good news through our denominational uh, ministries and missionaries. Thank you, church, for your faithful generosity. The gathering class continues with their study called Growth. It's going to happen online only at 9.30 a.m. To sign up, talk to Pastor Mike or click the link on the hub. Now let's go over to Pastor Kelly to see what's happening in Kid City Ministries today. Hey, Kid City, it's Pastor Kelly. We get to learn today about how God forgives us when we sin. It's going to be an awesome, awesome video. So make sure to check out the full video today on the church website under today's sermon link or on our Facebook page. Thanks, Kelly. Did you know next Sunday is the beginning of Advent, which means there's still time to buy me a Christmas gift? <laughs> I'm just kidding. But this season, we want you to be able to celebrate and prepare for the arrival of Jesus together. We have some Advent resources for you and your family. We have two options for you. The 25 Days of Christmas devotional book. It's available for $10. It actually features daily readings, fun and easy activities, and prayers appropriate for adults. Uh, children, and teenagers. We also have the Lifeway Kids Family Advent Guide. This is a free uh, guide, and it features weekly readings and activities, and this is suited for, suited for younger children. Stop by the hub today in the church foyer to pick up your copy for your family. Students, join us tonight for Trivia Night, 5.30 to 7 p.m. We're going to have a fun time gathering together for some games and prizes. You don't want to miss it. Grab a friend. Don't forget your mask and your water bottle. We're going to have a great time. Hey, next Sunday, we won't have youth group because of Thanksgiving. And then the first two Sundays in December, the 6th and the 13th, we're actually going to go online for those on Zoom. Check out social media or the website for more information. Church, thanks for worshiping with us today. We are so glad you're here. You know, if we can be of any assistance to you, please reach out to a pastor on staff because our hope is today that you experience the transforming love of God as you worship the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. With all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all that I have, I will sing, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. There is a river that flows unrestrained from your heart. Canyons of mercy so deep I could never depart. Father, your wonders are in. my soul let everything that has breath praise the lord let everything that has breath praise the lord praise the lord with all of my heart with all of my strength with all that Let everything that has breath, breath. 
good to see you this morning. It is good to have you with us. And once again, we're so pleased that you chose to begin your week here in the presence of God with his saints. Even if you are home somewhere or far away watching this online, I want to assure you that you are in the presence of God and you are with his saints. And it is good. It is always, always good for us to be together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you in this week where we take time to say thank you for Thanksgiving. I thank you for your kindness to us, for your love for us, for your protection over us. And God, as we go through this day, as we go through this week, I pray that you would be near and that you would keep us mindful that you are with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, I wanted to share some scripture with you this morning that is from the book of Ephesians, a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Ephesus. And he was talking about his love for them. And he says, Ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all his people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in all my prayers. This is Paul's prayer for the church in Ephesus, but it's also a prayer for us. This prayer. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that can be invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. As we celebrate this week, as we 
bring focus to thanksgiving to God. He is the one that fulfills in every way. And so we sing this song of thanksgiving. Steve? When I think about the Lord, how he saved me, how he raised me, how he filled me with the Holy Ghost, how he healed me to the uttermost. When I think about the Lord, how he picked me up, turned me around, how he set my feet on solid ground. Good morning, church family. You know, as a part of our in-person gathering today, we have an incredible opportunity to dedicate Grace Mariana and Simon Marcus Cole. And since you can't be with us uh, in person today, we want you still to be a part of this incredible tradition of God's people bringing their little ones to the Lord for dedication. You know, this dates back all the way to when Moses was telling us to, to remind our children as we rise, as we go to sleep, as we travel, as we stay home, to speak about God's laws and commands. And so today, Bob and Michelle, as parents, are signifying their desire to want to do this in the life of these two precious children. And as a part of this dedication process, we always ask our church family to participate by making several commitments to this family. So as Bob and Michelle have made this commitment to us, I want to ask you today, will you be shoulders for them to cry on at times? They're going to need you at times to gain insight and experience and how to parent their children and, and help them to understand how God is working in their life. So church family, will you do your best to model before Grace and Simon what it means to be a true disciple of Christ? Will you pray for them? And will you join with the family in believing that God's grace would take root in their life at a very young age? If you're willing, by the grace of God in your life, to make this commitment to the Cole family today, you can say it 
right in your living room or kitchen or wherever you may be, or you might even go to your computer and just type in, we will, right into the chat space today. Say those words out loud, though. We will. Thank you for your commitment to this family and your commitment to helping us all raise our children in a way that would be honoring to God. So I'm just curious today, have, have you discovered any untamed idols in your life over the past few weeks? I certainly know that I've realized uh, how things have taken a greater importance in my life as, as some of my own idols have kind of risen to the top as I've thought about these things. I'm curious if you've realized, though, of, of places in, uh, in your life that have taken a, a greater importance within your heart, maybe even within your emotions or within your thinking or your focus. It is during these kinds of times, these, these troubling times that we're certainly living in, where sometimes our, our idols can become more clearly seen. And I know for myself, there have been these realizations, these moments where I've trusted humanity over God, these moments where I've trusted myself even more than God, or even the institutions that I live in or the ideals that I, that I believe in, that I've trusted those things over God to work things out in my life. Today is our final week in this series called Untamed Idols. And, and as we get started, I just want to remind us of what this definition of idolatry is that we've been using. It's anything, anything that you place above God. Anything that you give more attention to, anything that your heart yearns for more than God can be an idol in your life. Do you remember back in March of this year when everything, the entire world felt like it stopped? I mean, we learned how to see our family through Zoom. We, we learned a lot about how to stay connected even when we physically couldn't. M many of us uh, didn't work for a while. Many of us learned to work from home. Either way, the truth is everything got really quiet. Everything seemed to slow down. We learned for a while how to play games with each other. We learned how to ration <laughs> toilet paper together. You know, in a way, initially, it felt like a gift to, to live life in quarantine together. Our online church attendance around the country literally shut the internet down as people were watching church all on Sunday mornings. Everyone had time suddenly to go to church because you could do it in your jammies sipping a cup of hot coffee. No travel baseball, no travel volleyball, no travel soccer. Every Sunday was suddenly available. No work conflicts, no family gatherings. Remember those days but then now, over these past eight months, what's happened is we've gradually allowed distractions to come back into our lives again. And the worship of those things that had gotten in our way before COVID have kind of crept back in. Yeah, I thought about this this week and realized this is pretty consistent with how we even read Scripture and the history of Israel and other nations. How they would often experience these moments of resurgence back to worshiping the Lord. They would tear down idols and they would destroy temples of gods who had been created in their nation and they would follow the, the Lord supremely. And then there would be these moments where those idols, those false gods would make comebacks and the people would be divided once again. Asherah and Baal were common gods of the ancient times and these gods, to worship them, were, were connected to love and war or the sun and moon and even fertility. Asherah and Baal worship has taken a lot of different looks in our lifetime. They, they kind of look differently. We, we've looked at three possible different idols in this series. Freedom. We've looked at politics, which is just basically power and authority. And last week we considered the idol of control. And the final idol that I want us to consider today is this, the idol of prosperity. It's that state that we understand that when someone is experiencing a successful or flourishing or thriving condition in their life, especially with, as it relates to financial 
uh, respects, right? It's just this idea of all around good fortune taking place in your life. In our world, there's so much discussion right now about the economy. I mean, we hear about it all the time. That's the way to make our nation great again, right? Is through the metric of a, a booming market. Even in the church today, one of the greatest threats to our message is the message that life gets better when you turn it over to Christ. But the threat is that, not that life doesn't necessarily get better, but it, the threat is that Jesus never offered anyone a better life in the way that we often measure life, in the way that we would metric our life as better or successful. Jesus did offer a fuller life once you've been emptied. Jesus did offer a life that would be filled with peace, but never absent of conflict. Jesus would often offer a life full of meaning and purpose, even though he nearly always guaranteed personal brokenness. This thread of preaching and promising uh, prosperity and success is commonly known in our world today as the prosperity gospel. And it's being embraced by many popular preachers of our day. Many of them you'll see on TV or hear on the radio. And, and not all of them are that way that you might see on TV, but it is a common thing. One of the more popular prosperity gospel preachers that you are probably familiar with is Joel Osteen. Now listen, I'm not saying that everybody that, that promotes this idea is necessarily horrible or bad, and I'm not saying that everything they say is wrong, but they do oftentimes lean, dangerously lean into a teaching that is a false narrative within our faith. And it can easily cause anyone then to worship this false god of prosperity and success. Greed and this hyper-focus of wealth and money is clearly warned against in Scripture. Don't be greedy, Paul writes, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. Think about the things of this world. So many of those things grab our attention. The Hebrew author also said, don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. See, money really isn't the issue because we all need money, right? The issue is that too often we love our money. We have this desire to grab more and more of it all the time. And I'll be honest with you, I'm probably talking to a crowd today that doesn't feel very rich or very wealthy at all. But if you look at world metrics of how much money you earn in a year, you might be surprised because a household a household income of $50,000 that contains a family of two adults, two children, and of course a dog and a cat, a household that makes $50,000 in our world today is in the top 10% of the entire world. In other words, if your household earns $50,000 in any given year, you are wealthier than 90% of the rest of the world. Now, I don't want you to think that God is somehow against wealth or against you experiencing prosperity or success. That's not the case. In fact, I believe God desires us to experience this. I believe it's a part of his hope and desire for many. But what he does command so clearly about this is that we cannot worship our wealth. We cannot worship our prosperity. And when you consider that each of the idols that we've looked at in this series, they really are good things. They're not all bad things inherently because I believe God actually wants some of them for our lives. I believe God is for freedom. I believe that God understands and desires that authority can be a good thing and even control. So the issue isn't the actual thing we've been talking about. I'm not anti any of those things that we've discussed. The question remains, and it has been for each week, is where do we place our trust? In what or in whom do we put our hope? Even who do, we, who do we give the power and authority of our life to? Because if it's in the freedoms that we are searching for, if it's in the control that we desire, or if it's even in our wealth, then we have bowed our hearts to the blessing that God desires to give instead of 
bowing our hearts supremely to the, the God who gave the blessing. So we can often get that off track. We can worship the blessing and forget the God who gives us the blessing. Whenever we give too much attention to the blessings that he offers, we can too often forget him all together. Listen, especially in our day and age, when all these idols and so many more that we don't have time to discuss are camouflaged right in front of us, we have got to keep our eyes on the Lord during seasons of blessing and especially during seasons of drought and seasons of struggle. Jesus said it clearly. If any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? This is a powerful picture in Scripture of this upside-down, inside-out kingdom of God that is constantly pushing against the social norms and the pressures of our day. But I understand how, how it can be really easy to get confused about how God thinks about wealth or success or prosperity. I mean, even when we see Him leading His people out of Egypt and 400 years of slavery behind them, He promised to take them to a land that they, known, they had known as Canaan. It was a land that God had promised them. And He constantly labeled this as a land flowing with milk and honey. You know, as a child, I would hear this story and I would hear how God promised this land and I would even hear songs about it. And it, this image would be conjured up in my mind about literally seeing streams of milk and, and, and honey flowing through the woods or flowing through the hills. I mean, it was just a kind of a weird thought. But to know what this really means throughout Hebrew history is that this is often used to describe abundance or sustainability. To, to have a land that would flow with milk and honey meant that this would be a land that could not only sustain human life, but that it could sustain livestock as well. And that it wouldn't do it just to a little bit, but that it would sustain it to a great quantity. That it would be a land that not only just provided the necessities of what the people would need, but that it would be a land that would be able to go above and beyond any expectations that they would have. And they had just come from a land of Egypt, which was a land filled with gold, filled with all kinds of things. And to be promising them a land of milk and honey meant that they were going to walk into the sweetest of sweets, that this land would be filled with the best of the best. So it seems to me that when we think about God and his leading of his people, that he is interested in providing great things for us. Get this, over the years, that, that phrase milk and honey also came to represent something more than just land or more than just what the land could provide for the people. It began to represent the feeding of God's word in the hearts of each person. The psalmist writes, how sweet your words taste to me. They are sweeter than honey. This really offers us a different image of what God desires to provide for us, right? In order to bring deep meaning into our existence and an incredible abundance into our life in every way. It's, it's actually not a land filled with, with stuff or things that it can get. Milk and honey actually represents His Word. It represents His presence in our life. When Paul wrote a letter to the church in Philippi, there was this moment where he thanked the church for helping him financially, for supporting him really financially through an offering. And as much as their gift had blessed him, he also wanted them to know that he has learned a lot about what it means to, to live in a life that is sustained in the good and in the bad. A life that understands what to do when things are going really well and when life is filled with many challenges. He wrote these words, Not that I have, was ever in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or empty, with plenty 
or a little. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Now, you might be familiar more with the verse 13 there that we ended with. This promise where we've, we've kind of grabbed a hold of this promise that we can accomplish anything we set our mind to. But in the context in which Paul wrote those words, he's actually saying that he has learned that his focus must remain purely on the Lord during seasons of feasting and during seasons of fasting, during seasons of plenty and during seasons of famine. So to understand this in greater context means we can accomplish all things in any moment in time as we trust God in the good and in the bad. So I'm wondering, are we this resilient in our world today? Do we live with that kind of resilience that, that Paul is talking about? Are we able to walk into seasons of frustration and seasons of having nothing without complaining or grumbling about it? Are we able to not fall into the trap of comparing ourselves to our neighbors, their, their house, their cars, their toys, or maybe even their beautiful Facebook or Instagram posts? I mean, it seems like we are just in this model of wanting more and more. I mean, after all, we live in a land that is a country that has over $20 trillion in debt. I mean, it just seems like everywhere we look, we cannot stop wanting more and more and more. Several times, Jesus told stories and, and had experiences where he would teach about the dangers of living with this hyper-focus on our wealth. He famously told a, a wealthy leader in one community to go home and sell everything he had and give it to the poor. He, he, one day he inspired Zacchaeus, the tax collector, to give back everything that he had acquired illegally from the people by taking too much taxes from them. And he did it. He, one day he praised a, a widow who had literally two cents to her name, and she gave it all in the offering. Over and over, Jesus challenges those who are, who are wanting to follow him, and, and still for a challenge for us today, to live this life with a loose grip on the things that truly just belong to this world. Jesus would always challenge those around him to leverage their wealth, not use it for their own gain. He would challenge them to leverage their wealth here on earth in order to store up treasures in heaven. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but it's a lot easier for me to measure my treasure here on earth than it is to imagine what kind of treasure I may be gaining in heaven. And so we spend all of that attention of what we can see. We give so much attention to what we can measure and plan on and count on in the here and the now. And we fail to see that what we really need to focus on is the next life and what we're going to experience in the tomorrow. So in the mix of all of Jesus' words on wealth and prosperity and how it relates to eternity, I became stuck on this story that Luke records that Jesus told one day. It's recorded in Luke chapter 16. It's a story of two men, two very different men. One lived in complete luxury. I mean, he had everything he could have ever desired in this world. The other was a poor beggar who literally laid at the gate of the other man's house and he begged for scraps from the man all the time. He was also covered with sores from the top of his body to the very bottom. The story goes that both of these men die and Jesus begins to peel back a layer here to help understand what takes place in life after death. The rich man we see is in torment. He's surrounded by flames and an intense heat. The other man, the poor man who is given the name Lazarus in the story, is seated next to Abraham comfortably at a banquet hall in a feast and they can see each other in this moment. Two very different outcomes. Let's pick up the story right here in Luke 16, verse 24. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. 
Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. That's a very sobering response to what's taking place in this scene. The, the wealthy man is rather persistent. And he comes to the conclusion that if he can't be helped, that maybe Abraham would send Lazarus back to the earth, back to his home, to where his four brothers live, and that they would be warned about the torment that he is experiencing. And Abraham essentially says, dude, those guys already have Moses, which represents the law. They already have all of the prophets, which represents the teaching and understanding of the law, to warn them. What could Lazarus do that Moses or the prophets haven't done? The rich man, though, is sure that if, if a man is brought back from the dead, that everyone will listen to what he has to say. Jesus, in telling the story, is offering a little foreshadowing of about what is to take place. Again, let's pick up in verse 31. But Abraham said, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, then they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. I want us to think about in the context of this story, who are we? Who are you in the context of the story? You know, are you the beggar known as Lazarus who is covered with sores, who has nothing, uh, nothing, no hope, no, no any kind of earthly possession, who lives every day to basically dumpster dive outside of the house of this rich man? Are you the kind of person who is dependent for everything? You're dependent upon God to even supply everything in your life. Or are you the wealthy man who essentially has everything that he could ever, ever desire and also ignoring the call to love his neighbor as himself? Are you the kind of person who is dependent on only yourself and your wealth? Well, I'll be honest with you, I don't think anybody really wants to acknowledge that we are the wealthy man in the story, but we might want to pay attention to this just a little bit. Because Abraham is absolutely correct when he says that, you know, they have the prophets and they have Moses. Because even resurrection, if Lazarus was to go back to tell them all of this, even resurrection has its limits of convincing people about the truth of Christ. There are many in our world today, many who believe that Jesus lived and that Jesus died and that Jesus came back from the dead. But they deny the redemption and they deny the salvation that is available to them because of His resurrection. I mean, let's just be honest. How many are going to show up in our church or show up online to celebrate Christmas in just a few weeks? And they'll return again at Easter. But they'll spend the next the other 50 weekends out of the year in complete denial of the truth that they want to come and celebrate on those two special holidays. God's truth is here. God's truth is here now. And we must be careful to walk in it even when it's unpopular, even when it's uncomfortable. God's truth is here. When we weigh, when we begin to weigh our own prosperity and wealth, as more important than loving others. And that could be through our time. We could love others through our resources. We could even love others through our own you know, energy. It's likely that if we've done that, that we are allowing the idol of prosperity to take over our mind, to take over our thinking, to take over our thoughts, and to take over our actions. This rich man in the story that Jesus is telling had plenty of opportunities to love on Lazarus in this earth. Lazarus practically lived at his front door. He walked by him multiple times a day. And yet the story seems to indicate that there's not an inkling of help that he ever gave him. That there's no moment where he offered any compassion to Lazarus in this life. And so it's a powerful story that reveals that what we value on this side of eternity versus what we will value on the other side 
of eternity. Let's take just a minute to think about that. What do we value in the here and the now? I think if we were to be honest, I think we would say we value our work. How many hours a week do we spend in, 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 in our job and, and, and thinking about how much we need to do for our occupation versus how much time we actually spend with our loved ones? We also probably value our income, which is connected to work. How many of us know how much money we make versus how much money we give away? We probably also value our stuff. We take care of our stuff. We, we wash all of our stuff. We, ta- we store all of our stuff. We have storage rooms for our stuff. We love our, our cars, our clothing, our vacations, our leisure time, our season tickets, even to losing teams. The reality is we love our stuff and all of it is going away. None of it will ever last and yet we spend so much time and energy to acquire it so much energy to earn enough money to get it but here's the question we really have to ask ourselves today is what will we value there what will we value on the next side of eternity well from the best of what i can tell we're going to value one thing and that is each other We're going to value our love for each other, our relationship with each other. We're going to value and celebrate our friendships here on earth and our family here on earth. It really comes down to this. We will value love. How we lived with love here will be celebrated in heaven. Paul said it this way. We know what real love is because Jesus gave up his life for us. So we also ought to give up our lives for our brothers and sisters. If someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or a sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show it. Let's show the truth rather by our actions. This is where the 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 idol of prosperity gets stripped out of our hands. This is where we defeat the idol of wealth when we allow ourselves not to just talk about love or talk about compassion, but we be people who sees a need and responds to it. Prosperity corrupts our relationship with God by making wealth the object of our affection. I want to state that statement one more time because I think you might need to hear it. Again, this is so important for us to hear today. Prosperity corrupts our relationship with God by making wealth the object of our affection. Today, friends, we have got to understand that the object of our affection drives our agenda. It drives our time management it drives our, our, our routines of every day. And when our job or our desire for wealth is the driving force, we are bowing our hearts to the idol of prosperity. But if we look at every day as an opportunity to serve someone else or be kind to someone else or love someone else, not just with our emotion, but with our funds, with our blessings, with the things that we have, then we know that we are trusting in God to take care of our needs and to take care of the needs of our brother or sister in Christ and those that we are coming in contact with every day. I want to ask you today, where do you find your confidence? Is it in your stuff? Is it in your money? Is it in your bank account? Or is it in your relationship with God? Where do you find your peace? What gives you peace inside of your soul Do you find peace in knowing that you have enough money? Or do you find peace in knowing that God has forgiven you of your sins? Where have you placed your trust? What are you placing your trust in? Whom are you placing your trust in? See, my confidence must be in His faithfulness. My peace must be rooted in trusting in God only. And my trust must be placed in the promises of God. Today, you might be here, you you might be listening online, and you don't consider yourself to be a follower of God right now. 
You've spent some time, though, searching for something to trust in. You've been searching for something that brings you that confidence. Maybe you've been searching for someone who is unchanging and good and worthy of putting your trust in. Well, friend, I want to tell you today that putting your trust in Jesus is the answer to your searching He is the one who has come, the Son of the living God who came not only to live for us, but to live out a life of mercy and grace and to model this for us. Jesus did not come to this world to judge, but he came to seek and to save the lost. Those are his words, not mine. He died as a sacrifice for your sins. And by doing this, He paid the price that none of us could afford to pay on our own. And it's his love that is reaching out to you today. Now, maybe you're listening today and you you know this truth, but you've begun to understand that you've allowed money or power or politics even, maybe even freedom to get in front of that truth. And you today need to knock down that idol You need to get it right. You can do it today. If you need to do business with God today, I'm challenging you right now to stop what you're doing. Stop what you're thinking and get ready to speak to the living, all-powerful, all-knowing King of kings and Lord of lords because God is as close as a whisper to your heart and soul today. And I encourage you, to speak to him about these things that he is already bringing to your attention, confessing your worship of a false idol, confessing your sin and your selfish living, and even admitting your need for him to give you another chance. Friends, I know without a shadow of a doubt that he will do it. He is faithful. He is a God of his word, and he longs to be with you. So let him come close to you. Let him come and love you on you and let's renounce the confusion let's renounce the the worship of anything that's got in, in our way outside of god and his mercy in our life pray with me father today we we recognize that there have been moments where we have trusted in our wealth more than you god there have been moments where we have trusted in our poverty we have focused on our poverty more than you and we have allowed that to stress us out we've allowed that to to give us fear that has robbed us of your joy god we recognize today that you and you alone are worthy of our trust that you and you alone are where we will find our confidence and you and you alone god are where we will find our peace As we sing now in response to you in this moment, God, I pray that you will allow us to sing a prayer to you that allows you to come in and to offer forgiveness and grace and mercy in our life and that our worship would be placed again squarely to you and to no other thing, to no other person, to no other ideal that we think about, but that we will worship you and you alone. Help me, God, in this. Help my friends who are listening right now in this as well. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Father of kindness, you have poured out grace. Brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you my help inside me.
Friends, thanks again for joining us today. I pray that as you've sung, as you've listened to God's Word, that you have felt the Holy Spirit stir inside of you and that He's drawing you closer and closer to Himself. That He's acknowledging things that are in your life that we all need to walk away from and and maybe you've made those decisions over the course of this series. I pray that you have. I know there have been things I've needed to die to and God is helping me with all of that. I want to remind you again that on the hub on our website, you will find a a discussion guide that you can download and look at, even print off and take to work if you would like or whatever, however you would like to use it to continue the thought process of this conversation and allow ourselves to be challenged by His Word. But I want to leave you with this thought from 1 Thessalonians. Now, may the God of peace Himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. I trust that you will find great confidence in the Lord as you trust in Him. God bless you.